Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to lecture number three of the Solar MOOC. Uh, tonight we have Jeff Gilbert who will be discussing uh, managing the project. And uh, here is Jeff. Um, Jeff has an extensive background. He's the uh, president of Asthma Solar Training LLC. He provides technical and business development training for the solar energy community. <clears throat> he brings 18 years of experience in renewable energy design, installation, troubleshooting, and business development. Uh, he's been certified by NAPSEP uh, for both solar and uh, uh, photovoltaic and solar thermal systems. And I will go ahead and turn over control to Jeff as the presenter. Okay, Jeff. You have control. <laughs> All right. I'm going to share my desktop here. Excellent. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, this is exciting. And we're going to be talking about managing the project, which is section B of the, um, uh, the job task analysis. And I've got... Um, about 60 slides, well, a bit less than 60 slides, uh, so we're really going to go at, at quite a pace. I'm excited to be a part of this whole uh, MOOC, which I think is a, what a fabulous way to uh, share knowledge and get to know each other as well. Um, let's see, are there anything that I want to say first? Um, most of the information about me was on the press release, and Richard was good enough to give me an introduction, so that's um, basically it. Let's go ahead and jump into the content of this, and if some other things pop up into my mind, I'll just spontaneously say them. So what we're going to be doing today is just talking about what it takes to manage the project. And uh, taking right from the job task analysis, we see that this section is 17% of the total examination. So it's not insignificant. Now it's it's um, you know third place behind uh, verifying the system and uh, installing the electrical components. So it's it's pretty significant. Um, some of the sections that I'll be going through, I'll just touch on briefly because they are very subjective, and there's not really anything in um, in the uh, the study guide that it, that there is to memorize. You know so. Uh, most of the stuff that we have to really kind of hunker down on here are safety issues. That's, that's the biggest portion. Um, so I'll spend some time and, and uh, go a little bit slower. So we're going to be covering six sections, uh, the pre-construction, securing permits and approvals, managing the project labor, adapting system design, managing the project equipment, and then implementing, implementing site-specific safety plan. So the six section we'll spend uh, the most time on. All right, so don't, don't get overwhelmed by all the text on this slide. Uh, what I did is I, from my experience, I wrote down everything that goes into a project, and then I broke them, uh, all these items, into categories. The blue ones have to do with uh, uh, tasks that are sales related, and the red ones are design related, and the green ones are operations related. And then the black text is just part of the, uh, the green um, uh, operations. I'm going to be talking mostly about the operations part of uh, this process today. All right, pre-construction meetings. Now, taken right from the job task analysis, we have two critical uh, bullet points, which is uh, plan weather contingencies and verify site conditions. Uh, and match them to the design. And then there are a bunch of other items. I won't go through them uh, piece by piece, but um, very largely they are subjective. So it really depends on the project. It depends on your style of management, on how these items get done. And uh, so, frankly, I don't expect there to be many, if any, questions on the exam for things like um, you know, communicate construction strategy to the customer. Well, of course you have to do that. That's very important but it's not like there's going to be a, uh, an exam question because it's so subjective in how you do that. 
But just to touch on the first two, the weather and then the uh, verifying site conditions, there are some weather contingencies that can pop up, and they certainly do. We have extreme heat, extreme cold, extreme mud, <laughs> extreme rain, uh, ice-covered roofs, and uh, frozen ground conditions. Of course, there's many more things that can come up. Um, this picture of the ice-covered roof, I do not recommend installing in the uh, icy snow conditions. Uh, let, me, let me say a few words about the slides and the photos that I'm going to be showing. Um, my intent is to communicate as much information as possible in the shortest amount of time. So to do this, I go to Google Images and I borrow lots of pictures. Uh, as you can see, I've not given credit to these, these two guys installing you know, on an icy roof. I have no idea who they are. I just searched for um, this image and I found it, so I'm showing it. So, you know, if you know those guys, uh, tell them congrats for being on the show. And, <laughs> Uh, but um, uh, no credits being given. I'm not uh, publishing this information, so copyright is, has been bent a little bit here. All right, so, um, and then verifying site conditions to match the design. This is something I want to just point out that a lot of uh, installers these days are actually doing the sales process by telephone. They will go to uh, a satellite image of the property with the client over the phone and generate a proposal and in many cases not actually go out to the site to take physical measurements and meet in person with the client uh, as part of the sales process. And then once the client signs on the dotted line, then a representative will go out and actually take real measurements. This, uh, when, it, when companies were first doing this, I thought they were nuts and I thought they were you know, shortchanging the customer, but it seems that this is becoming more and more popular. So if you decide to do it this way, uh, there are some things to be careful for. Um, you know, you're going to be using satellite images, and you may even use standardized system packages. You know, like, all right, we do basically 10 system sizes for residential you know, uh, systems, and here they are. Here's what you have to choose from. And that can make the, the uh, proposal process much simpler, because then you're not custom designing every project. Um, but mistakes can happen. For example, um, satellite images are several years old, so what you're looking at might not be true to what's actually out on the site. And if you're relying on satellite images to get critical measurements, you could be in trouble. Sometimes you need to you know, get an actual tape measure out there for the final adjustment. Uh, also, shading may not uh, show up very well on a satellite image. You know, trees and the height of those trees and how long those shadows get cast in the wintertime may not show up very well. Um, let's see. Also, from experience, uh, open trenches and holes will fill during heavy rain. These are mistakes that can happen. And, and so if, you, if, if a project gets stretched out over a number of days or weeks, things can change on the site. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm pointing to here. And then uh, also, <laughs> this last item, on a cloudy day, it is possible. I've seen it done for someone to go out and actually take all the measurements of a roof, but take the measurements on the north roof, not the south roof. And so uh, my colleague, uh, I don't think he'll ever live this down for getting lots of good roof measurements on the wrong roof. And so uh, uh, fortunately, we had sent out another um, employee who looked at the correct roof on a sunny day, and he can clearly see which was which. And so it's fun to tease him about that. All right, let's see. Securing permits and approval. This is the next uh, number two section. And we don't actually have any critical bullet points in this section, but I will kind of go through the process really quickly for those who have not already uh, gotten their feet wet with the approval and, and permitting. Um, let me just jump right into this slide. There are six steps, six parts to this typical permitting package. And there could be more uh, pieces to it, but this is the most common um, set of information that a, that a typical permitting authority wants to see. First thing, title page. And so the title page would include contractor information, project site address, description of the project, a table of contents of all the other uh, pages that will be included, and maybe some comments down at the bottom. And I just came up with this sample. 
And actually, it was kind of funny when I was uh, creating this hypothetical company, ABC Solar, and then I decided, hey, how about Sunnyvale, California, as an example? And I literally went to a random place on the map using uh, Google Maps, and when I zoomed in, the place that I chose happened to be where a house is that actually has solar on it. So what are the chances? I guess all the homes in California have solar, so chances were greater. But uh, that little circle there is showing a house that actually has solar already on it. Okay, so the second part of the package is the completed permitting forms. And in most jurisdictions, certainly here in Maryland where I'm speaking from, we always need an electric, electrical permit and a building permit. Electrical is obvious because we're doing electrical work, but a building permit is needed in this area because we're mounting things usually to a roof. If we're doing a ground mount, then they may want to see some kind of uh, structural drawing showing how we're going to uh, do that without it falling over or staying away from the, the property line or some easement like that. Uh, also, on electrical permits, unless it's California and they're used to doing a lot of solar, um, we're going to have to put in the information under other. So, you know, you might want to just write in photovoltaic power system or wiring of a PV system, something like that. Most forms won't already have this information. All right, the next item is the site plan showing all the major components. So here's a nice picture taken right from John, Dun John Dunlop, I'm sorry, James Dunlop's book, Jim Dunlop, get it right. Um, and so we have the array layout, the inverter location, conduit run, location of access pathways on the rooftop. This would be for a, uh, a commercial roof. And uh, this is information that the fire department might want to see. Any setbacks from property lines if you're doing a ground mount and the location of utility disconnects if that's required. So all this will be included on this site plan. Uh, in the old days, we would do it by hand. And nowadays, everybody can produce a drawing that looks at least as good as this one because there is Google SketchUp, which is a free um, drawing program that's very simple to use. And you can create plans that look just like this you know, in like 15 minutes. And it only takes about a half hour to learn how to do that 15-minute plan. All right, next in line here is a detailed electrical diagram showing all the information about the system. This is very important. Maybe it's the most important part. And here's an example, kind of a, a, a wire diagram template that I created um, where I can actually enter all this information onto it uh, to keep using the same diagram over and over again. But in this wiring diagram, we need to show information about the modules, about the array, about the wire specifications and sizes, conduit type sizes, uh, overcurrent protection device locations and ratings, information on disconnects, signs, uh, and, and labels, all the information about a, a job so that an electrician can look at the set of plans and go, oh, I know exactly what I'm doing here. Not a problem. And you could install it for you. All right, the next item. Now, structure information. So we want everything that the permitting officials need to know about how you're going to secure this to the structure or ground mount or whatever you're doing. You know, what um, manufacturer, the array size and weight, anchoring, racking, materials, what flashing method and waterproofing, and uh, equipment grounding. You might even want to include some information about how you'll be doing equipment grounding. And the last item on this package is a spec or spec sheets for all the equipment that you're going to be using. So here we have, you know, the modules, the racking, the inverter, uh, disconnect, anything that you might um, include as part of your system, include a spec sheet for, so that they can see uh, that these items are listed and approved, and that they're, you know, if you're doing your own racking system. Um, because you know how to work with aluminum and weld steel or something like that, it may take a little longer to go through the permitting process. But if everything is from uh, existing manufacturers and they're designed specifically for the purposes of uh, installing solar, then it should go pretty quick. All right, that's it for the permitting package. Permits should always be posted in a conspicuous location. Notice I'm really flying through this material. We got uh, like um, 
you know, two hours worth of stuff to deliver in one hour, and we're really trying to hit it all here. All right. I'm not going to go too deep into this, even though there are five uh, what they call critical items here. Again, these are all very subjective. Coordinate with the subcontractors, of course. Determine order of tasks, allocate resources, supervise project crews, communicate aspects of the safety plan. All of these are, of course, critical and important, but there's nothing really to memorize uh, from the study guide that's going to show up on the exam. So I won't spend any real time on this slide or, or going through these items. Adapting the system design. Basically the same with this. Um, we have some critical items, but nothing to memorize. You know, when you first give a, um, a proposal to the client and they sign off on it, you already have an idea of how you're going to how you're going to install the system. You know, what components you're going to use and uh, and how it's going to lay out on the roof. But if you've done the design from satellite images. After you get the signed contract, then you're going to want to send out somebody who will actually take real measurements. And they may find out that, whoops, uh, we can't put an array of 21 modules. Really, we can only fit 20 modules or something like that. It might uh, change slightly, and you might have to uh, do an adaptation to the, uh, the original proposal. So that's really all there is to say uh, in, in this area. Managing the project equipment. No critical items on this list, uh, and again, very subjective. Take delivery of the components, of course, schedule deliveries, identify lift uh, and handling areas, performing equipment inspections, all the uh, necessary parts of managing a project. This is a, a picture of a uh, project that we did for the Cape Gazette in Lewis, Delaware. It was fun. Oh, this is the roof where uh, we almost uh, designed the system for the north side of the uh, building. That was funny. All right, I won't let him live that down. All right, now we're going to spend the rest of uh, the presentation working on site-specific site plans. This is where uh, the details are, and, and you'll need to memorize some stuff, write notes, or uh, um, do whatever you need to do to memorize this information, because this is mostly where the questions on the exam are going to come from. All right, we have performing a hazard analysis and identifying those hazards, uh, ladder safety, fall protection, electrical safety, and personal protective equipment. And I think a lot of these other ones will also be covered under the slides that I'm going to show, just covering these six areas. Safety is no accident. <laughs> Everybody always has that in the slideshow, so I had to include it as well. All right, on the job site, there is a lot that can go wrong safety-wise. You can trip on things, you can electrocute yourself, you can cut yourself, you can you know, get zapped, burned, scraped, you have things fall on your head. It is a construction site. There's lots of opportunities to get hurt, falling off roofs. So we have the OSHA 29 CFR Part 1926 to tell us just how we should do our job. Now, this is... Um, OSHA stands for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. You probably already knew, unless you are an international participant on this call, and you might not have known this, uh, then the 29 stands for Volume 29 of the OSHA Code, and CFR stands for the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations. In other countries, there's probably an equivalent some uh, organization that tries to make sure that uh, people on a job site are safety. But this is specific to the United States code. And then we have part 1926, which applies to general construction, which is mostly what we're doing. We're getting out there, getting our hands dirty, and putting ourselves in harm's way. There are, what does it look like, seven different subparts that we should be concerned about. Uh, subpart C, D, E, I, K, M, X. Each of these uh, pertain to different parts of the safety of doing a photovoltaic installation. A couple of them that you should, well, you should try to commit all of these to memory. Um, let's see. Uh, subpart E, you could just say that stands for equipment. 
um, subpart K, which is electrical. You could think of kilovolts. This is how I remember them. <laughs> subpart M is for fall protection. Uh, so if you were to fall while you're falling in midair, you might say, mother. So M stands for mother. I don't know. Whatever gimmick that works for you for memorizing uh, that subpart M has to do with fall protection. And for me, subpart X you know, I just imagine the structure of a, a ladder almost kind of looks like the letter X. So that's how I remember that one. Whatever works for you guys. Okay, so there's a lot of text on this page, but I'll simplify it. Basically, we're looking at the responsibilities of the employer and the uh, responsibilities of the employee. The employer is mostly responsible for making the, uh, the project site safe. They have to uh, make it free of hazards or identify the hazards and let you know about them. They need to uh, provide safety training for all the employees. If there are 11 or more employees, they must maintain records of occupational injuries and illness. All employers must display the OSHA poster. If you haven't seen that, you can go online and uh, see it and get yourself a copy of that poster. You know, for the average installer contractor that has, you know, several employees, you're going to have that posted in, a, you know, in some kind of common space. All employers must report death or hospitalization within eight hours if there are three or more employees in the company. And mostly these last two, these are the ones to, to really remember that the employer's responsibility is to assess the workplace for hazards and then protect the employee by reducing those hazards. This is mostly at the job site that you're going to, uh, um, that the employer is going to be uh, acting on these last two bullet items. Now the employee responsibility is to use the personal protective equipment in accordance with the training and instructions. That's the re employee's responsibility. And of course to report hazards um, to OSHA and also cooperate with OSHA inspectors. In all my years of installing, I've only had one OSHA inspector show up at a job site. In fact, they weren't, um, they didn't intend to come to our job site. They were just showing up because there was a construction site right across the street, and the inspector just decided to look at what we were doing while I was there. But it's, it's, because it's certainly expected, uh, you know, in a large commercial site to uh, have drive-bys occasionally from the inspectors. All right, now we're going to go a little bit deeper into electrical hazards, which is subpart K for kilovolts. That's what I call it. The severity of an electrical shock depends on the path of the current through the body and the amount of current going through the body and also the duration of your exposure to that current. Current is low as 10 millivolts, I'm sorry, 10 milliamps can paralyze muscles. That's not much at all, milliamps, that's just nothing. Uh, currents above 75 milliamps can cause rapid, ineffective heartbeat, and even cause death in a few minutes. Most of the work that we're doing would not subject us to these uh, amperages over an extended period of time. Usually if we feel a shock, we're gonna let go real fast. Uh, but th this, this uh, uh, amperage can hurt or kill us even at these small amounts. And so remember this, uh, 10 milliamps is for paralyzing muscles and 70 milliamps um, can mess up your heart and even kill you. So in case that those questions pop up on the exam. All right, so I'm showing uh, a simple line diagram of a typical solar energy system. I've kind of shown two at the same time, a uh, simple grid-connected system, as well as a battery-based system, just to show the different electrical wiring parts in places where there's some, some danger. On the DC side of the system, of course, we have voltages up to 600 volts. Uh, this is for residential and uh, up to uh, two-family residential. If you go into big industrial and um, big you know, megawatt scale projects, you could even have voltages up to 1,200 volts. 
certainly there's a lot of danger involved there, and this is DC uh, current. On the AC side of the system, usually in residential applications, it's 240 volts. Here in the United States, it would be 220 overseas. Um, and of course, in uh, commercial applications, we could see 208, 277, 240. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They're all dangerous. You can get hurt by them. Uh, the next category here is the wiring that comes from the battery bank to the inverter, if this was a battery-based system. Now, 12 volts up to 48 volts, nominal battery voltage. Are those really dangerous voltages for the human body? So far, my experience has been no. I mean, I've touched 48 volts before, and um, you know, it was nothing more than a little tingle, even if my fingers were wet. So it's not really the voltage that's going to hurt you. It takes more voltage to push amps through the resistance of a human body. So this isn't really where the danger is. Where the real danger is is in the stored energy in batteries, usually lead-acid batteries. The bigger the battery bank, the greater the uh, potential amperage that can be released all at once. And this is, you know, you can get uh, thousands of amps coming out all at once. And they may not go through you because there's not enough voltage to push them through your body, or at least not very much of those through your body. But where the real danger is, is in somehow shorting out the batteries. Uh, you know, when you're, if anyone's put together a battery box, putting in big batteries and trying to wire them while they're in a metal box, there's all kinds of opportunity for having your ratchet wrench touch, uh, you know, the metal, grounded metal or another terminal, and then all kinds of sparks will fly. So that's where the real danger is, is releasing, you know, thousands of amps all at one time and causing fires and causing sparks flying everywhere. It's dangerous. Never open a touch safe fuse, uh, I'm sorry, a touch safe fuse holder while it's under load. Uh, for those of you who don't really have any experience with these fuse holders, you'll find them in almost all combiner boxes, unless they're just a little pass through box with two or fewer strings, then the combiner box is going to have fuse holders. It's going to have some kind of overcurrent protection, very often fuse holders. If it's a lower voltage system, it might have um, circuit breakers, as shown in the, in the uh, picture to the left there. But um, Midnight Solar was kind enough to put these uh, pictures on the internet and share them with us. What we're looking at here is um, fire damage from an arc flash that was a result of a 250 volt array that uh, the, the current coming from the array was only 5 amps. Uh, when this fuse holder was opened. Wait. See, the problem is opening the fuse holder under load, and it, then it causes an arc flash, and, and you have lots of problems. Uh, even though this fuse holder was rated for 1,000 volts DC at 30 amps, it only took 250 volts at 5 amps to cause a fire. Why? Because it was open to the load. So don't open it under load. It even, it even says that right on the fuse holder. Do not open under load. So it's trying to keep you safe there. All right. Fires can happen. These are, uh, again, wonderful pictures that were uh, distributed on the Internet. The one that's in the upper uh, left here is a residential system, clearly shown. All of the other three systems, all the other three pictures, are of are of a uh, commercial system that was on a Target building, a Target um, shopping, uh, for those of you who are international, Target is like a big Walmart sort of thing. And uh, I don't know what the size of the system was, but clearly you can see all kinds of fire damage. And you can even see down here in the lower right uh, picture, you're looking at those, those kind of uh, lines at the roof decking. It uh, burned through the roof insulation and the membrane and and they removed one of the rows of ballasted uh, modules. So you're looking right down on the, uh, the metal roof pan. This, uh, just in case you uh, haven't read the document on this, they did a whole investigation for why this uh, fire actually broke out. And, and it turns out, to the best of their you know, experience and guess uh, about why the fire happened, is that they had two ground faults simultaneously. The first ground fault um, opened up 
the ground fault protection is built into the inverter, and so it turned off the system and uh, everything was safe. But then in between the time of that ground fault and somebody coming out and actually servicing it or realizing that there was a ground fault, a second ground fault happened. And it was that second ground fault in combination with the first ground fault that created a loop, a current loop. So all this, the, uh, the power from the array actually had a path. A almost open or almost a short circuit path that it would just fly right through and, uh, and cause a fire. And there was nothing to stop it. There's no no switch that somebody could pull to turn off this fire. It had to burn itself out, or the fire folks had to get up there and spray it down with water and foam, which I think uh, was what actually happened. All right. Measures to avoid electrical shocks. Use barriers and guards to prevent access to energized equipment. Pre-plan your work. Post hazard warnings and use protective measures. Keep the workspace clear of cords so you're not tripping over stuff. And if you're using, using an extension cord, use a three-wire type that has the ground. And use, it, uh, use the extra hard, the uh, heavy-duty um, protective sheathing. And also, if you're doing service on, a, um, uh, on an existing system, use lockout tagout. The whole purpose for this is to protect workers. Um, you know, let's say, for example, you have a large commercial system and you go into the electric room and you turn off the, uh, the DC disconnect and maybe you can turn off the inverter and then you go up on the roof and you want to isolate some circuits. You want to pull some of those um, um, fuse holders to isolate, maybe you thought there was a fuse out. Uh, if you're up on the roof working and someone comes into the electrical room, when they say one of your crew folks, and they say, oh, somebody left the system off, let me turn it back on again. Well, now you're going to be undoing a fuse holder that's under load, and we saw what happens when that uh, occurs. So the whole idea of lockout tagout is to put signage and even a lock to make it so that nobody can turn the system back on while you're doing work on it. All right, fall protection, subpart M for mother. Sorry, I can't stop saying that. <laughs> All right, first thing to remember, memorize this, the six-foot rule, six-foot height rule. So here's a wonderful photograph that somebody, was, uh, somebody posted on the Internet. I borrow lots of great photos here. And they're putting in one of these uh, metal standing seam unisolar uh, systems. And the height is greater than six feet. So these folks should be using fall protection, and they are not. But the picture is too small for me to identify who they are, so they got away with it. Hopefully nobody fell off the roof. The rule, the six-foot rule, applies to walkways and ramps, holes and excavations, roofs, wall openings, and skylights. Any time that you can fall through, fall over, fall, you know, in any, way, in any way greater than six feet, then you should have some kind of fall protection system in place. The exception to this rule uh, is for doing a site survey or an inspector. Uh, if you're going to be climbing up on the roof just to take measurements for designing a solar energy system, then you do not need to have fall protection. Uh, it would be kind of silly because getting up on the roof the first time to secure the anchor point means that you're going to be up there without fall protection. So at some point, people do walk around in high places without any protection. So you just got to be careful. The rule, the six-foot rule, is for doing work above this height, not just walking up there to do a quick inspection or taking measurements. All right, so what are the different fall protection options that you have at your disposal? We have guardrails, safety nets, and then personal fall arrest system. Let's talk about the guardrails at first. How high do the guardrails need to be? Well, OSHA says somewhere between 39 and 45 inches. You can remember it that way, or you, you could just remember it's 42 inches plus or minus 3 inches. And for you folks who are international, sorry about all the inches and the uh, standard American units. We did try to convert over to metric way back in the 70s with President Carter, but we never did it. So we're back to 
you know, feet and inches and pounds and all these ridiculous units. Uh, basically, we can just remember the height of a railing is very close to one meter. We're doing it by metric units. All right, another piece of information about guardrails is that they must have a middle rail or mesh. Because let's say a short person comes along and, and the uh, top rail catches them right in the middle of the back or upper part of the back. Their butt could stick right through the uh, railing and they could fall that way. So there has to be some kind of a mid rail or mesh netting or something like that. Also, there needs to be a tow board. And the tow board needs to stick up at least three and a half inches which happens to be the height of the piece of plywood, two by four plywood, um, uh, plywood, uh, two by four lumber up on its edge. Uh, the exception to this baseboard rule or the tow board rule is if you put the guardrail, let's say you're on a flat commercial roof and you put this guardrail uh, up against the parapet wall around the building. Some parapet walls are you know, somewhere between you know, five inches and uh, one or two feet in height. If there's a parapet wall, then you would not need this tow board. The whole purpose of the tow board is to um, reduce the chance of tools falling to uh, people below and hitting them on the head. All right, the last piece of information about railings you know, or guardrails is that it must resist uh, 200 pounds, again, uh, English units here, 200 pound force uh, that's lateral, or actually in any direction. But you can see this guy, if he lost his balance, this rail would need to hold up 200 pounds worth. All right, so next, safety nets. I've never actually done a solar energy job using a safety net, but they are used, and if you were to use them, the safety net could not be more than 30 feet below the working space. Uh, shown in this picture is um, uh, a net set up for doing work on a bridge. Uh, I don't know if you can imagine, you know, being hundreds of feet above the water and then having a net that's 30 feet below you would be rather frightening. But anyway, so that's it with safety nets. Personal fall arrest systems. The two key things to remember about these is that you've got to have a harness. In almost all cases, you're going to be using a full body harness. There are exceptions to this, but don't think about the exceptions. You just want to pass the exam and just think in terms of, of a full body harness. And the anchor point needs to hold 5,000 pounds of force. So if you were to fall off the edge and fall 10 feet and then come to a sudden stop with the rope uh, pulling taut, that anchor point needs to be able to hold you. Personal fall arrest systems. It's just some pictures of the equipment that we're using, the harness, the anchor points. You could use a retractable um, lanyard. They're actually pretty good. Uh, it's amazing how many products have come about just recently that are uh, really kind of uh, catering to the um, solar installer. One of the things, if you've ever been to fall protection uh, safety training, uh, and I've been to a few courses, they always show these beautiful pictures of somebody in some industrial facility where they're uh, on some scaffold and they just sort of reach up to an I-beam above them to click on to get an anchor point. Well, I've never seen any I-beam above a home, you know, a residential or commercial roof. There's never anything above us to click on to. So we always have to have our anchor point be below us, which is uh, not convenient. But that's kind of the way it is. The different anchors that we might use. And it seems that there is an anchor for every application, whether it's a standing metal seam roof or some variation on a uh, metal roof, an asphalt shingle roof. Uh, this lower right picture even shows a ballasted anchor, which is great because then you don't have to put a hole in the roof membrane or, or secure to some structure. You can actually use uh, a ballasted anchor as shown there. Um, slide not shown, resist the temptation to secure a rope to your truck. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous. But this would definitely be a case of uh, lockout tag out and not to leave the keys available to anyone to drive away if you were to secure an anchor, you know, 
uh, having the truck on one, one side of the house and running the rope from the bumper all the way over the roof uh, to the other side. I don't recommend doing that, though I have seen it done before. That's not in the study manual. Maybe you can forget that if I just said that. Uh, all right, next thing, skylight hazards. As it turns out, skylights are responsible for more fatalities than any other fall, apparently, what I read. Uh, because you can imagine you're uh, kind of walking backward and you trip backward over uh, a curb, one of these uh, skylight curbs, and you fall right through the skylight and there's nothing to stop you. So there are some devices, either railings or nets or screens or something. Um, we did an installation one time on a roof that was very much like these three pictures to the bottom here. And they were, um, you know, it's a metal roof with raised seams. And uh, the metal part of the roof is strong enough to hold people walking around. But um, to let in light to the workspace below, they put in these fiberglass sections. And the fiberglass is not strong enough to hold you. You can see uh, a hole there where somebody fell through. What we did is, because um, we, we didn't know about any of these mesh products, we just put plywood over each of the skylights. So whatever method works, and you've got to think it out ahead of time. Conditions requiring stairways and ladders. Here's some more stuff to memorize. There's most probably a question will be on the exam covering one of these uh, pieces of information. First, for points of access on a job site with over 19 inches of break uh, from one area to another, you need to have a ladder or a stairway. So the picture uh, above, you can clearly see that you'd need a stairway to get from the lower section to the upper section. But the lower picture, or actually the picture in the middle, this is an example of when you would also need a stairway or ladder, which I think is kind of ridiculous. But this is what OSHA says, 19 inches is the, is the height that they've officially uh, set for needing some kind of a ladder or stairway. If you do have a stairway, and it has four or more risers, or it's higher than 30 inches, then you're going to have to have handrails on this. And those handrails have to be able to uh, handle 200 pounds of lateral force. Also, the steps need to be somewhere between 30 and 50 degrees as a slope. So you can't have them too steep and they can't be uh, too shallow. And the, the height of the rise, so let's say you had a stairway of uh, 12 steps and you decided to make the stairway yourself using some um, uh, dimensional lumber, the height or the space between the, um, the riser or, or the, the treads has to be consistent. And it has to be the same within a quarter inch. Because, you know, when you're climbing steps, your brain kind of locks in on uh, how high you have to lift your leg to go the, to the next step. And if one of the steps is slightly less or slightly more, then you can easily trip up. Landings must be at least 30 inches deep and 22 inches wide for every 12 feet of vertical rise. So for example, uh, if you had a fire escape on a uh, residential uh, apartment building, you would have to have a number of landings every 12 feet at least and each of these landings would have to be at least 30 inches by 22 inches, for example. And then finally, uh, where doors or gates open directly onto a stairway, a platform must be used that extends, that extends at least 20 inches beyond the swing of the door, as shown in that little drawing. And whoever did that drawing and posted it on Google Images, thank you, because I needed something and there wasn't a photograph. All right, the proper ladder slope. Here's what you remember. Key things, the height from where you lean it against the gutter or the building, that vertical height compared to the horizontal distance away from that vertical drop has to be a ratio of one to four. So if you're going up 16 feet, then you go out four feet, very simple. If there happens to be a question on the exam that doesn't give you, you know, one to four ratio, and it gives you and it asks you in degrees, 
just remember it's pretty close to 75 degrees. Anything steeper and it'll be difficult to climb and once you get up near the top you could actually fall back. So steeper is not good. And anything shallower is going to put a lot of downward force on the gutter or whatever um, that you're resting against. And there's a greater chance that it'll, um, uh, what is it called, uh, slip out at the bottom. The higher you get, the greater the outward force at the bottom of the ladder. So if you were to put the ladder, let's say, on somebody's deck, uh, and the deck has a little bit of slime on it, and it just rained, and you're going to have a slippery surface, and the higher you climb on that ladder, the greater that um, outward force at the bottom of the ladder. So this, this uh, one to four ratio makes it as safe as possible. I know, I told you more than you needed to know about that. Uh, as shown with this worker here, if you were just to put your toes right at the bottom of the ladder and extend your arms, you would end up with just about the same uh, 75 degree tilt angle. The next main important thing to remember is that your ladder must stick up above where it rests on the building at least three feet or about a meter. This is so that you have something to hold on to when you're climbing on and off the ladder. That transition on and off the ladder is the most dangerous and the scariest part of getting on and off a roof. So three feet sticking above. Uh, also, secure the ladder so it doesn't slide back and forth. And here's five different pictures of how you can secure the ladder. The upper left picture, I've never seen that device, but I found a picture of it here on the internet, so I decided to include it. The most common thing we used to do was just use a bungee cord, as the lower right picture shows. Also, keep ladders away from power lines, at least 10 feet away. And use a fiberglass ladder, preferably, because it's not going to be conductive. These are the two things to remember here. Stay 10 feet away from electrical lines and or use a fiberglass ladder. Also, we recommend using a standoff, some kind of a uh, thing that stabilizes the ladder. Good idea. And I personally recommend using these ladder extensions. If you haven't ever seen these, I highly recommend them. They are amazing. They allow you to step through the ladder instead of stepping around and they give you that three feet, so you don't have to worry about whether you've got uh, the three feet or not sticking up. There's some obvious things not to do. All right, enough with the laughs. <laughs> uh, let's see, next, uh, personal protective equipment, and this could be head protection, eye protection, non-slip shoes, gloves, sun protection, fall protection, all these sort of things. These are what the employee is responsible for using in accordance with manufacturer's recommendations and the training that they have been given by their employer. A couple things about hard hats, just in case it shows up on the exam. There are two types, type one and type two. Type one is this yellow hat that just has, uh, it protects you from things falling directly on your head. Type two hats have a brim all the way around and they can protect uh, from the sides as well to some extent. So that's type one and type two. Within those two types of hats, uh, you have class G, class E, and class C. Class G is the most common. It used to be called class A, but they changed the classification. This is a general service hearth hat suitable for construction, having good impact protection and limited voltage protection. So G, class G stands for general, easy to remember. Class E is for electrical protection. These are hard hats intended for electrical and utility work. So they also protect against falling objects, but they protect against high voltage shocks and burns as well. And then class C, which is conductive, those are cheapy hats. They really don't do much, but kind of give you a comfortable uh, hat that will protect you from um, bumps and bruises and walking in attics and hitting your head. So uh, I would generally recommend class G or class E. Eye protection falls into three basic categories. We have safety glasses, goggles, and face shields. Safety glasses are going to be used to protect, you, to protect your eyes from 
flying debris, impact, and sun if, or brightness if, uh, if they are tinted or polarized. Goggles would be used to protect against chemical splashes and vapors if uh, for non-vented. I don't know anyone that uses goggles on a solar energy installation site. They were just be very uncomfortable and they would probably fog up a lot. Uh, face shields could be used for doing electrical work. Certainly, uh, I don't expect there to be any welding on this uh, job site for um, photovoltaic installations, but it could happen. If you use a face shield, um, the face shield is supplementary. You're still supposed to use safety glasses underneath the face shield. Ear protection. It must be worn. Here's some more stuff to memorize. Must be worn when the exposure exceeds eight hours at 90 decibels or greater, or for any period of time where this, the, the noise level is above 115 decibels. They come in two categories, either ear muffs or ear plugs. Basically, uh, what they say is anything more than um, or 90 decibels would be uh, if you have to raise your voice from more than three feet away or less than three feet away. Uh, that's when uh, you're exceeding 90 decibels. And I think this uh, may be one of the last slides. Hand and foot protection. Gloves and shoes. Seems pretty obvious. Gloves, uh, you want to protect your hands from really hot materials up on the roof if you're doing uh, installations during the summertime. They protect you from heat cuts and scrapes. Uh, and then there are also electrical gloves that you should wear when doing electrical work on live wires or wires thought to be live. Shoes, when worn on asphalt or sloped roofs, really need to have a good grip. Tell your shoes to get a grip. Uh, they need to protect you from slipping, heat, puncture, scrapes, cuts, impact, and compression. There are two categories, like uh, steel toe boots, need to have uh, a classification for impact resistance and also compression resistance. Those are two different measures that ANSI measures for. And uh, they also may have electrical resistance. In my years of 18 years of installing, I've just used climbing boots. Um, I'm sorry, regular like hiking boots with a good soft sole. Uh, I recommend a flatter sole that it, it chews up roofs less, like asphalt shingles when they get really hot, they get soft, and, and a, uh, a boot that has a lot of tread could actually do a lot of damage to a asphalt shingle roof. So uh, shown here, you can see the tread. There basically is no tread to this boot that's shown uh, near the bottom there, so it'll do a lot less damage. All right, this is the end, and right up close to one hour. So I've completed all of the content for this class. Uh, now we're opening to questions. Also, uh, and I'll leave this slide open. If you want to give me a call, my number is 301-509-7954. Don't call me right now because I'm actually using this phone to uh, do this call. But anytime in the future, feel free to give me a call if you had a question or uh, just want to chat solar. And then my email is written there as well. I'm going to look at the uh, questions that you may have written. And, uh, so if you do have a question, go ahead and type it in on the little chat window that you have. Hopefully you understand the use of that little uh, screen. Ah, here's a question from Sarah Raymar. Would you spray water on a problematic array, uh, potentially carrying current down to the fireman? Hold on, I'm going to read this myself uh, several times and then I'll respond to it. No, um, so the question is really, you know, if you're, if you're putting out a fire, uh, if I understand this correctly, uh, if you're putting out a fire using a spray of water uh, and you have an electrified array, could the electricity follow its way back down the water? I'm not actually uh, an expert on that, but I would expect not. I think the water uh, is discontinuous at the point where uh, it sprays all the way up there, so I don't think you could actually get yourself electrocuted uh, by trying to spray water on an electrical fire. Maybe, <laughs> I won't go there. 
Do you need all the permits you were talking about if you are just replacing the panels on your system? Hey, it's a great question. So, uh, Michelle Roberts, no, I don't think so. If you're doing service on an existing system, like just changing out some modules, I do not think that you need an electrical permit. I think uh, somewhere there is a, a line of demarcation between doing some simple service work and uh, doing some major work. And uh, not being a, a master electrician, I don't know what that line of demarcation is. But by the way, my background is mechanical engineering with a whole lot of experience just doing this hands-on uh, for 18 years. Um, so I don't think so. I think you, uh, any new installation is going to require a permit. And any major change, like a heavy up uh, on a panel, uh, any change like that, uh, that would require it. If you were going to if you were going to move panels from the roof to a ground mount, great question. I think then yes, in a sense, what you're doing is installing a new ground mounted system. So in that case, I think uh, technically you should get an electrical permit because you're. Uh, your electrical connection is going to be new. You may still be tying into that same uh, backfed breaker at the service panel and using the same inverter. You know, that's a good question. I am not qualified to answer that question, but it certainly comes a whole lot closer to needing a permit than your first question or how I understood your first question. Any other questions? Either I did a really good job, or this is really simple information, or there's nobody left. Many people are left, uh, participants. We still have 24 people. All right, so I either did a great job, or um, let's see. Jeremy says it depends on if it's a city or not, or if it's in the city. Yeah, it's a good point. I think there are different different rules for different jurisdictions as well. The best way to answer the question about whether you need a permit for doing some service work uh, would be to call the permitting office, call the authority having jurisdiction, and let them answer that question. You're welcome, Sarah. My pleasure. All right. Well, I'll, uh, I'll stay open for another minute or two if somebody else has a question. But uh, this will be basically it. All right, folks. Well, thanks for joining us. This was a great, uh, well, it was great for me. <laughs> Hopefully it was great for you. <laughs> Happy. Hi there. Well, uh, Thanks, everybody, for attending. And uh, again, Jeff put up his contact information. If you have any other questions you want to ask him, please feel free to contact him. And um, so uh, I am uh, just want to have a chance to speak directly to you since the first night a week ago. And at that point, we didn't have the video. So I am Captain Redson. I'm with Soul Power People with Richard here. And um, just wanted to, uh, before we start, excuse me? Can you still hear me, Jeff? I can still hear you. Oh, good. Uh, another question came in. It was uh, oh, okay. addressed real quick, I think. It says, is there ever a reason to use a retractable fall protection on a roof? Uh, yes, if I understand your question correctly, the retractable fall protection is basically a, a spring spool of you know, maybe 30 feet of cable. Uh, I, I recommend them, actually, because if you use rope, you're going to end up with a lot of rope all over the roof, and it, the rope itself will become a hazard. You can usually step on it and it'll roll under your feet like a ball bearing. Uh, so the retractable lifeline can be very useful to uh, keep a little bit of tension and keep rope, ropes off of the, uh, the walking surface. That's it. Okay. Well, um, if you have uh, additional questions, uh, as you know, we have um, – forum. We have other uh, ways for you to communicate with each other. And, and before we sign off tonight, I just wanted to mention a few points. Um, the, uh, one of the, yes, this is a real 
you know, course, online course, or just like other things, there's a lot of things that we're trying to put out from us to you in terms of course content. So if you, I just want to make sure that everybody is realizing that every day we've been publishing newsletters that include all the aggregate of the information that's going out there uh, under our hashtag solar MOOC, as well as information, uh, videos, and things with problem sets and solutions. And so if there's anyone out there that hasn't been getting the daily newsletters or hasn't had a chance to look at them, we really urge you to do so because uh, there's a lot of course content that's in there. We've been publishing problem sets. We've had several of you submitting problems and, and revisions to problems and sample problems, which is great. Uh, Richard has gone on and made several videos of different solutions explaining things. So there is a lot of course content that uh, in addition to these webinars we want to make sure you're taking advantage of. But what makes a MOOC new and different, what makes it different from other online learning experiences is that this is really your course. And so we wanted to, just, before you sign off tonight, uh, remind you that um, you have an opportunity to create problems uh, based on what you're seeing in study guides, what you're seeing in the code. And if you come across something that you think would make a, a good problem for everybody to try to work on, take a, ch a chance at um, putting something together and testing out your answers and trying to come up with sample wrong answers so that you can kind of see what, you know, NAPSEP might want to do. But, uh, you know, they always say when you think you know something, uh, try to teach it. And you can do that by helping to create uh, problems for other people in the course to work on. As you get our problems or problems from other people, come up with different ways of solving them, and then insights on how you approach the problem, and then share them with one another. So what we're trying to, um, what I want to remind you to do tonight is I guess I'm trying to encourage and kind of push you out of the nest a little bit and have you uh, making more time um, within this course to try to, you know, connect with one another, <clears throat> share some additional resources, and don't solely rely on us or the presenters to provide content to you. What makes a MOOC different is this two-way street between the presenters and between us that are hosting the course and um, those of you that are out there participating in it. Um, and how do I... We want you to connect with each other. That's the most important part. Um, so, all right, Mike, I saw your question. I'll get to that in a second. Social media, uh, there are tweets, Facebook pages, event pages. When you're online, sometimes you can see other people that are part of the MOOC that may have been online with you if you've shared and tried to connect with one another. Um, you can be forming online study groups on discussions and things of, those, of that nature where you're sharing information with each other. What makes a MOOC different from other courses is that it's not totally instructor-led. It's actually the students in a true MOOC literally take over the class and start running with each other in forming these informal groups or sometimes formal groups that are supposed to live on long after the course ends, forming these communities of connectivity uh, around a problem or an issue, which in this case is the NAPSEP certification, which really is the proper way of best practices to be approaching solar installations. So there's nothing that would prevent any of you from continuing these relationships that you establish, you know, long after the course. So we ask you, do put some blog posts up, things you're coming across that are useful, questions that are stumping you, things that you've heard from other people that have taken the test or things that you need to key on. Post those things in the forums. Set up some discussion groups. Um, utilize the tools that the web provides to interconnect with each other and uh, make this class take on a life of its own. Um, okay, and uh, lastly, um, there we go. Uh, Mike, you had asked the question, where should we be right now? And so I want to touch base on that. And basically, um, at this point, when we talked to you the first night a week ago, you know, what I was went over was kind of how to set up a plan where you look at the next 23 days at that point and start, you know, planning out what you're going to do each day, what things you know, what things you don't know. Check in with yourself by taking practice tests. And when you take those tests and when you quiz yourself, try to get the answers without having your resource materials there and looking them up. Take your best stab at these things on your own. You may get it right, you may get it wrong. If you get it right, that means that's something that you know. If you get it wrong, that means it's something that you don't know. If when you're doing the problem sets or you approach certain things, what you do is rely on looking up the answer, then all you know is that when you look up the answer, you get it right, which you won't have the opportunity to do. 
So are you sticking to your schedule? Are you doing all the practice problems? Are you doing the um, reading assignments? You know, so check in with your schedule, see what time you've got left, see what you're going to be able to fit in within that time, and start budgeting out that time so that you know that you have time to, to do it. At this point, last week's topic, or Monday's topic, if you will, was uh, verifying system design, which if you look at the job task analysis, um, it could make up up to 30% of the questions on the test. So you definitely want to weigh in heavily on Monday's topic. Um, Mike Holt covered that. And there's a lot of great information in his textbook and materials there and in the study guide and the handbook that goes with the NEC. So really want to zero in on that. Tonight's topic was uh, managing the project. And Jeff's got a ton of experience in that. He did an excellent job of reviewing those concepts in the JTA and honing in on safety, which is job one in solar work. Um, next time we'll get into installing the system. And so in between installing the system and verifying system design, that represents about 50% of the test. And so that's where you should be now moving into that third domain. And then you're going to have time to then be checking in on the first two. It's kind of like that uh, uh, partridge in a pear tree song where every time you sing it down to the beginning, it always ends with a partridge in a pear tree. Every time you sit down to study, you want to start with verifying the system design, review those concepts in topic area number one, look back over project management, some of the things we talked about tonight, always be thinking about safety. I mean, that's what the NEC code is all about, is safety, right? And then as you get into installing, um, what, are the, what are the things you need to be thinking about? And as you build through each topic, start with the first and keep adding on as you go. So we'll be checking back in with you on Monday. Look for, some, for our next speaker talking on that subject. Be looking for additional problem sets and solutions to be coming your way. And again, if you have any questions or concerns or issues, talk to each other. Let, let us know. Uh, look in on those daily newsletters and, and keep those cards and letters coming. It's going great. We're up to 174 participants now, and uh, we're really excited for, for all of this. So thank you very much for your attention this evening, and we look forward to maximizing the MOOC and getting you guys ready to pass this exam. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kathy.